and welcome everyone back in. Hello, hello. Excellent. So welcome everybody to our second session this afternoon. We are joined by Dr. Layla Kuja. Did I say that right? No, yeah, Kuja Walker. That's close enough, love. You're right. <laughs> <laughs> she is an ed tech expert and ex teacher focused on social issues. So, a thought leader in online learning with wide experience of R&D and technology for social benefit, she has over 25 years in teaching, curriculum design, and educational research. As the co-founder of Persona Education, Layla is on a mission to boost the well-being and employability of young people through developing their social emotional skills. She is focused in... Uh, she is also a senior lecturer in education and childhood at the University of West England, focusing her teaching and research on skill development needed for successful social and learning and work outcomes. So that's a lengthy way of announcing and introducing our next speaker. This is Layla, whenever you're ready. Hi, everyone. Really nice to have been invited um, to this session. Actually, before I get started, um, Sarah Lynn, I thought I'd just shared my slides. Can you actually see them on your screen? You can. All right. OK, I just hope it's the correct set of slides I just shared. Um, I can tell you what we see. We see uh, pink writing, developing social emotional schools, theory and strategies for every classroom. Perfect. perfect. OK, well, um, thank you for those very kind words. Um, I actually I am a teacher. I have been a teacher since I qualified in 1993. So whether I'm actively in the classroom in a secondary school, which was where I lived and breathed for many years, or I'm um, up at the university teaching from 18 year olds who just feel like um, special sixth formers sometimes to, uh, to much older students. Um, I'm very much an educator and that, that is me. Uh, in a nutshell, basically, over the next um, hour, my aim is to share with you um, theory and um, research behind social and emotional um, learning. I'm not sure if any of this has been covered so far today. I'm sure the term may have been uh, mentioned at least when you've been looking at things like well-being. Um, so I want to give you the background to this 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 term, social and emotional learning, which is becoming more prevalent certainly in our schools and from my um, occasional discussion with tutors or uh, tutor organisations seems to be something that they're becoming more and more aware of or certainly more overtly aware of in terms of their own practice. Um, so that's going to be the first half of this session and I'm going to make it a, a bit interactive so get get ready on your chat because uh, I want to hear from you. It's a lot more interesting than listening to me for an hour. Um, and then the second half will be, I'm going to share with you 10 strategies that I often share with schools and teachers from whatever discipline to just start getting a feel for it in their classroom. Now, I'm obviously aware that you are tutors. You are not in, in school. Some of you may be, I don't know, actually, but 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 the premise of this is obviously you guys as, as tutors. Um, so I tried to consider that in my um, strategies, um, but here's my disclaimer. <laughs> I am not a tutor. I have tutored in the past, uh, but I would not, I, I, I am not an expert in tutoring. So even though I'm gonna hopefully share with you some, some knowledge on social and emotional learning, and some strategies. Actually, I'm gonna be very interested in hearing from you guys, which of those you think would or wouldn't work or what would need to happen in terms of adapting them to work in your scenarios. So um, that in a nutshell is what I'm hoping you guys will get out of it this, this next hour. Um, again, in chat, if you want to add anything in terms of, you know, you wanna explore anything a bit different, if we've got time, I'm um, hopefully there's a bit of Q&A at the end as well. OK, so as I say, the webinar's in two parts. And the first bit is really just unpicking this idea of social and emotional learning. So what I want you to do to begin with is in chat. I want you to you don't have to write me an essay, <laughs> but write a word. And that word could be a skill 
or a behavior or some description maybe when you hear the term social and emotional learning what are you what are you thinking of as a, as a tutor so i'm going to give you two minutes in chat just put down some some whatever comes into your head it doesn't it doesn't have to make sense even when you start typing it just what's 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 the noise happening when you hear this term social and emotional learning if you can pop your thoughts into chat i'm going to give you two minutes just so you've got some time to just process a little bit learning collaboratively so i'm just going to read some of them as they come in Oh, they're coming in. I'm trying to work at the chat whilst we do this. Uh, buh, 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 buh. Knowing how to interact with themselves and others in social settings and communicating emotions. I love it. Emotional literacy, having knowledge, emotional re regulation. That's a cracking one. Knowledge of mental processes and peer interaction. Wow, this is good stuff. I'll just wait a few more moments. Sometimes we don't like silence, do we? But I've one of the things I've learned when uh, researching social and emotional learning is the need sometimes to just give people time to to actually think and process information. Understanding social cues, emotional intuition, having a sense of pride for working with others. What a lovely phrase. OK. OK, now, if anything comes to mind as we go through this, please, please do keep adding to, to chat. So let me share with you one such definition. Now, if my slides, for whatever reason, seem to be getting stuck, please do um, do say. So you should be seeing a slide now with a definition from UNESCO. I'm not going to read it. I'm going to let you read it. Uh, thanks, Sarah, um, because you're more than able to. But you'll see some of the terms that I've highlighted there are some of the things that you've already mentioned in chat. Um, the idea around um, recognizing your emotions and um, being able to regulate those emotions. This idea around relationships. That's fine, Elizabeth. I'm, I'm making my daughter uh, get the train today home. She's not too happy because I'm doing this. <laughs> OK, so there's one such um, working relation, um, working um, uh, definition for social and emotional learning. But what I want to do now is really unpick what this actually means and why perhaps schools and anybody in education is actually um, talking more about social emotional learning and more to the point actually applying it within their educational practice so to do so i'm going to delve into some research okay so you know global research from different sources always seem to point to the same results um, so if you just focus on the graph to the left you see that from the ages of 10 through the ages, um, say, 18, 19, well-being declines. And that may not be a surprise to you um, with your own interactions with teenagers. Could be your own teenagers or the teenagers you are, um, in fact, tutoring. And then an important thing to point out with that graph is notice the um, red line, which is girls. Girls decline in well-being greater than boys over that um, age period. So in chat, I just wanted to get some ideas from you guys. First of all, why do you think, whether they're boys or girls, why do you think well-being drops from the ages of 10 to 18? What are you seeing? What are you witnessing that makes you um, recognize that, that graph? Exam stress. Thank you, Kirsten. Oh, hi, Kirsten. <laughs> Hormones, peer pressure, access. Yeah, wanting to be independent, growing expectations to do things independently, socialising without parents. Social media, my goodness, yeah. Yeah. 
can just wait to see if anybody else has got any more. Social media, definitely. Yeah. Girls' emotions need support. That's a really interesting one to, to unpick, I suppose, Jay, especially when we look at comparing that with boys, all emotions. Mm. Interesting. Girls' friendships. Yes, being the mother of a 13 year old, I can identify with that. And boys need support. Yeah. <laughs> brilliant. Brilliant. OK, so so well-being is that, you know, it's that well-documented, very noisy um, uh, piece we're hearing a lot of in the press and we're feeling it at home and at, in our schools and in our educational spaces at the moment. But I want to take your attention to the, the middle um, uh, stats. Now, this information on social and emotional skills was taken from an OECD report in September 21. And they monitored, I think it was 18 different skills. And what they did was they compared a group of 10 year olds with a group of 15 year olds. And they did this in 10 different global settings. And they asked the students, the teachers and the parents information to collect this data against um, these 18 um, skills that they picked out. There was only two skills, only two of the 18 skills um, that the OECD measured that a 15 year old was greater or better at than a 10 year old. So the trend that the OECD um, identified from their global report on social and emotional skills less than two years ago was that, in fact, social and emotional skills on average decreased from the ages of 10 to 15. So your average 10 year old has, in other words, better social and emotional skills than a 15 year old. And this relationship with well-being is not a separate one. They are um, linked to 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 some extent. And obviously, the impact of this is that, you know, our students have got less agency, potentially purpose because of the lack of these skills. They're actually achieving lower attainment, which is obviously an obsession uh, within our education system. Um, and in fact, there's reduced employability as well. So this decline in well-being, this decline in social and emotional skills is really taking its toll on our um, adolescents, on our, on our teenagers, which again is the information that's feeding into education at the moment to say, OK, we know this, what are we going to do about it? But this information, this research, you know, this idea of social and emotional skills is not new. You know, you can go back to philosophers. This one is Ladzi in uh, the sixth um, century, who said he who controls others may be powerful, but he who has mastered himself is mightier still. You know, at the heart of social and emotional learning does lie this concept of knowing yourself first then understanding others so that you're able to build effective relationships and you know make better decisions and that's really what social and emotional learning is all about but as i say this is nothing new to to humans and those that have studied humans this is something we have known from at least the sixth um, century bc i can find you aristotle um uh, quotes that that correlates with with similar um, sayings. But what I want to do um, just to sort of go into a bit more detail of social emotional skills and potentially which ones we're, we're, we're interested in, I'm going to go into this report in a little bit more detail. So this is the OECD report, and I cannot emphasize enough how if you've got the time do read this report. It's one of the most um, instrumental pieces of research I've ever read that's influenced my own teaching. And it's what's influenced my work that I now do with university or schools um, now in 40 countries. It really is a key piece of, of research. And actually, its overriding um, finding was this. Unlike academic learning, the development of students does not follow a steady upward trend, i.e. everything else. If you measure maths, if you measure English, if you measure their language acquisition, if you measure um, maybe they're even their, their um, 
physical education, things tend to take an upward trend when you follow their educational progress, some to a lesser extent than others. But when it comes to their social and emotional learning, it's the reverse. So something is going, something's happening and the education system, if we want to focus on that, isn't addressing this yet. We're not, but we're not booking this trend and we need to look at how do we book this trend. So the key findings in this research were, as we've mentioned, you know, the average 15 year old has less social and emotional skills than the average 10 year old. And for girls, it's even um, it's even greater. Actually, in chat, just just out of interest, can anybody write down any ideas? Why do you think and I haven't necessarily got the answer to this. Why do you think um, girls um, in particular have a greater decline than boys in social and emotional skills? Be really interested to hear your views. Yeah, that's really interesting, Jay. Perhaps girls mature faster, so it becomes harder for them sooner. Yeah, OK, yeah. Um, our culture encourages girls to still be caretakers. Interesting. And in adolescence, they come up against more obstacles and conflicts, but don't have the tools. Gosh, yeah, really interesting observations. I haven't necessarily got the answer to this. And this is where more research is required to really delve into maybe the biological changes that are going on or the social pressures that may be different for girls um, alongside boys, etc. Remember, I said um, the OECD looked at um, 18 metrics or 18 social and emotional skills. There were, in fact, two social and emotional skills that 15 year olds did score higher, but only just. And they were tolerance. So a 15 year old on average has more tolerance than a 10 year old. Hmm. <laughs> Sometimes when you look in your own personal uh, group of uh, children and wonder, but that's what the average is and assertiveness so maybe no surprise the average 15 year old is more assertive than the average 10 year old but everything else everything else the 10 year old thanks julia the 10 year old is scoring higher okay here's a question for you which and put this in chat which gender group do you think reported higher in empathy responsibility and cooperation, boys or girls. I know we should think gender is more fluid than that, but I'm just using the language of the report. So apologies for using boys and girls. Um, but boys or girls reported higher in empathy, responsibility and cooperation. OK, Jade saying boys. Right, so we've got a bit of a mix. OK, so it was, in fact, girls. It was, in fact, girls. OK, here's your second one. Which gender group reported higher in emotional regulation, sociableness and higher energy? Yeah, maybe you're guessing like how, how she put these uh, slides together. She's doing a mix. But yeah, you're right. It's boys. All right. Now, I was actually when I first read this, I, I sort of recognised the higher energy from my own observations. But actually, the emotional regulation to begin with, I thought, gosh, really, boys? And then I remember who has friendship issues more, you know, when you're working with them, who who seems to be, you know, having the more the, the relationship up and downs. Yeah, it, it tends to be, you know, anecdotally, um, girl, um, the girls. So. Anyway, interesting stuff from OECD. The last thing they um, they reported on was the difference in OEC, um, sorry, on socioeconomic backgrounds. And this is depressing, but no surprise. Socioeconomically advantaged students report higher social and emotional skills than others. OK, 
So that won't come as any surprise, I'm sure, to us. But out of all 18 metrics, there was no advantage of being from a, um, a lower socioeconomic um, background. Interestingly, there was nothing reported around neurodiversity um, missing from OECD, um, but their reports are continuing. So um, it'd be interesting if that's something that they, they start to bring out or should start bringing out as an important um, element of their research. But in terms of um, how did their findings impact grades, they're obviously looking at grades. The OECD, you probably know, are the ones who publish PISA results. So it's how countries sort of get compared with maths and English, et cetera. There's a bit of an obsession there. Um, but anyway, interestingly, when it comes to actually social emotional skills and grades, there's definitely um, links between having good social emotional skills and grades. So again, it won't surprise you that, you know, they said if you know, if you show persistence, it's strongly related to, to improve school grades, but in particular in reading, in mathematics and the arts. So actually quite a, a broad sense across the curricula. Stress resistance and being optimistic are strongly related to lower levels of test anxiety. Again, you probably didn't need me to give you this OECD report to know that correlation. Being stress resistant, optimistic and in control of your emotions reported higher levels of psychological well-being. So a lot of the work that's done in social and emotional learning is getting students to identify their emotions, to recognize their emotions if they can. All right. Not all can. Um, and so you have to, to work out ways in which they can identify that and then identify maybe their triggers. So they can start to self-regulate those emotions a little bit more. And that massively impacts their well-being. Interestingly, and I'd love, I don't know if there's anybody who teaches maths, trust is positively related to maths grades. Has anybody got a thought on why that might be? Trust, the skill of trust is positively related to maths grades. Any ideas? I haven't. They didn't give it. You feel comfortable to try. Isn't yeah. It, yeah, interesting. Actually, Sarah, do you want to just come off a uh, mute and explain that a little bit more? Yeah, I feel like when we build trust with our with our students, we're allowing them to be in a space where they can be more more vulnerable, and being vulnerable means that we're going to be able to be okay with not getting things right. And if we have the pressure of feeling like we can't try and fail in front of the person that we're with, then that's where we tend to close off and, and all of the obstacles and performance happen. Yeah, that's really interesting. Julia, your point's interesting as well. Can you just um, talk that through, that idea that maths is binary? So um, I'm an English person. <laughs> and um, I love English because you sort of can't get it wrong, um, you know, within parameters. And with math, you can really, really get it wrong. And the anxiety that I relate to would be coming from, do I dare have a go and get something blatantly, flagrantly wrong? Because although we talk about, you know, show your workings and, and the process and all of that, mm. um, we tend to look straight at the bottom line for a tick or a cross. Yeah, interesting. Um, and in English, we get absolutely Vicky. In English, I could submit an essay and have lots and lots and lots of ticks all the way down it, couldn't I? Um, mm. And in maths, it won't look like that. Oh, I've either got it right or wrong. Can I just add a bit there, Julia? Yeah, Sorry. hi, Vicky. Hi. Hello. I'm, I'm back after all those hours. Um, yeah, no, I, and sorry, I'm, I sound a bit cold. So I'm indoors with a happy glove on. Um, well, you look um, cozy. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, I, I use maths a lot to model failure, to break the barrier of fa failure. Not that we're, you know, I don't celebrate failure. I act like I do, but I don't. But I did a really good modeling, well, we did it with the origami actually. And I was like, I can't do it. I can't do it. And then the girl was, because she'd been in the right old, super in class with it so I then redid it and I was like hang on and we, we managed to learn how to do it obviously um and I can't do it yet and that going through that cycle and it being okay that we can't do it yet 
but actually doing a you know spending a whole session doing something like that then learning that failure and it being okay to fail and the more as a one-on-one tutor that they are failing but not all the time but we're we're learning from that and the reason if you'd got it all right I wouldn't have bothered getting out of bed there would be no need for me to tutor you and I would have a job I don't have money (laughs) so you know and every now and then you know I can come up with those but I think I really do think the younger the younger we can accept that failure is okay um having talked about it all so negatively earlier actually how else are we going to learn if we don't Mm -hmm. know it we can't we can't do it so we have to learn and we learn through our mistakes yeah and and it might be a thing about terminology as well actually in terms Mm -hmm. of this word failure is it a failure or is it just where you are in your learning journey Mm. you know sometimes you have to get that answer to enable you to move on to maybe the more accepted answer or idea you know I t- my background science so we we often deal with you know the first thing that we work with is, is around prior knowledge you know what misconceptions there's a lot of misconceptions that come into the science classroom because science is based on observations you hear what your parents explanation of why there's a rainbow or whatever and these are all the th- ideas that you bring into the classroom that aren't necessarily uh the the, the most common uh representation from a scientific um side so sometimes maybe it's terminology as well but it's it's lovely to hear that and in fact sarah you said modeling and i'm going to come on to modeling there's there's nothing better than modeling and in fact i'm just writing a white paper and and the section i'm writing on is is around actually why is it beneficial for teachers own well-being and social and emotional development for them to deliver social and emotional programs and it's because we learn when you teach you are learning in order to to do the teaching and so by default you are developing those strategies and potentially putting them into practice with your tutees or your students and therefore you're modeling as well so it's it's really interesting stuff okay my last thing i'm going to share with you on the research and then we're going to talk through some strategies is Um, Castle um, in the US are phenomenal when it comes to understanding social emotional learning. They really coined the phrase, actually, really is a bit of an American term that's been adopted um, worldwide. We commonly would um, in the past would say life skills, but life skills has got a little bit more confused, maybe with like um, financial skills or um, uh, I'm trying to think of another one, but financial skills is the obvious one or, or, or you know, um, being able to cook for yourself, those sorts of life skills, which are really important. Social and emotional skills obviously ha- has um, correlation with, you know, it sits under life skills, but it's a specific set of skills to help us, um, you know, uh, to help us make better decisions really through healthier relationships as such. Anyway, Castle do loads of research and and a lot of their research for obvious reasons is in schools and is in classrooms and again i know that you guys are tutors but this this has correlations i would say so when schools have uh, delivered social and emotional pro, um, programs um overtly um you see actually quite a positive um, set of results, not just in their academics, but attainments. And and people, you know, research shows an 11% um, improvement control um, compared to control groups, actually. That that figure of 11% is pretty consistent. Um, But also in terms of their social behavior, their emotional distress, their attitudes, um, et cetera. So it really does benefit holistically the young person, whether it's their social, their learning or their future work um, uh, context, uh, life that you're supporting. So hopefully, guys, that's just giving you some noise. I talk a lot about noise, uh, but I think learning is a noisy place. And then sometimes we connect some of that noise and it starts to make sense. And sometimes it, it stays as noise and we just have to accept the noise. Anyway, hopefully some of that noise will have been useful to you. Um, what I want to do now is go through um, 10 strategies that I often share with um, teachers in schools quite often. Um, in terms of if you've got no resource uh, 
or you've got no additional curriculum time, you know, how do you still put in some social and emotional learning within the everyday classroom? Because certainly from my own work, I, I don't see an argument for not using social and emotional learning in every um, uh, tutor session, in every uh, maths lesson, every science lesson, regardless of where you are. So here are 10 strategies. But again, as I say, these were based on a scenario where you typically had a teacher with a group of students. All right. So when we go through these, I've tried to um, uh, adopt and, and, and consider, you know, how that would work for you potentially one to one in person um, or um, even online. OK, but I'd be really interested to know, you know, what works and what wouldn't work from your experience. I, as I say, disclaimer, I'm not a uh, expert in tutoring, but I'm just here to give you some um, additional noise around social and emotional learning. So the first thing is, is setting lesson intentions. You know, it's good practice. I train teachers up at the University of West of England. And, and one of the key things you, you, you're told is, you know, have, have, your, have an intention for the lesson and overtly, you know, say what that, those intentions are with your, your students so they know what's expected of them. And it's also something for them to be able to hopefully celebrate at the end. Um, oh, brilliant, Georgina. Um, celebrate at the end, um, you know, what they've achieved. You know, coming to the end of the session and having a sense of achievement is super important, isn't it? So actually, I would argue that whilst you're, say, delivering science and say, you know, the whole purpose of this lesson is to be able to understand photosynthesis, right? If your session was around, um, say, preparing them for a test or um, an exam, which I'm, I'm sure is quite common for some of you tutors, actually, why not throw in some additional intentions to your uh, tutoring session or, or, or lesson, whatever it is? And it could be, you know, whilst we're, you know, revising X, Y and Z, actually, we're also going to consider maybe some stress management strategies or ways in which you could manage your feelings during test periods. Now, throughout these slides, I've highlighted in purple what are seen as social and emotional skills. So they're just really thrown out at you. One of the reasons for having these intentions is obviously you want to deploy them within the class, but actually just putting it out there and being overt, you're more likely to do something about it. All right. And also it helps you and the students start bringing this into your parlance, your everyday parlance. Um, so you could start discussing this, maybe just giving them a tip or a strategy. It doesn't have to take um, very long, but actually you're just beginning to embed some relatable social and emotional skills to to lessons as they apply. Going back to the research, why? Because social and emotional skills has such an impact on their ability to not just um, achieve high grades, but their um, ability to navigate their lives generally and to make better decisions, um, whether that's in their relationships um, or elsewhere. So that's one simple thing you could do. OK. Um, the second thing is around, um, well, promoting peer to peer learning. Now, I know that not all of you will um, always have group sessions. Some of it will be one to one. So please just bear with me with this one. But, you know, as teachers, we're encouraged to support dialogue. Dialogue is seen as important when it comes to social constructivism, which is a key um, element of learning. So how do we um, how do we encourage dialogue in the classroom? Well, if it's even just one to one, you obviously are their dialogue peer. So it can even work with you as the tutor and them as the student. But obviously, if you've got groups or, or small groups, you can actually actively have them um, engaged in peers. And even and I don't know what you think of this. I've done some teaching where I will put them out if it's online and to breakout rooms and I will trust them in their break in the breakout room, say in Zoom or whichever um, application I'm using. And the reason I'm trusting them is because when I bring them back, what they then inform me will give me a sense of what went on in that breakout room. But giving them the trust, the agency, 
which is a key skill to actually go off and do that discussion, have that interaction, actually is an important social and emotional skill that we're supporting them with. But these skills of dialogue do support um, the skills such as active listening, um, processing information and empathy. And one thing you can do, even if it's you and, and the tutee, um, or you've got a group, is actually have them in turns, or you and the tutee have it in turns, actually listening and then responding. So this idea of active listening is really interesting. I do it with the university students and I'll, I'll explain to them what I want from active listening. I want your A, your B, you're going to say something about this question I've just posed. The other person's going to listen. And then after 30 seconds, you're going to swap. B will start talking, A will listen. And then when they finished, if I'm teaching, I'll say, OK, A, what did B tell you? B, what did A tell you? And what you're supporting there is, is cooperative learning. But in terms of skills, you're encouraging active listening, i.e. stop thinking about what you're going to say next and not listening to them properly. Start processing information in terms of actually understanding what the other person said. Um, so it's something you can do if you've got small groups online or in person, but potentially you can do that even as the tutor and your student is, is practice those skills. Um, and it's good sometimes for us as teachers, isn't it, to just go zip it and actually just let them talk. OK. Three, um, problem solving. Um, so many of our students come into to class with with misconceptions um, and, and really that our ability to support them to to move on from those misconceptions, especially in a subject like science, is, is really important. And that requires problem solving skills. And so the skills of creative thinking, critical thinking, the teamwork obviously is important, but communication is key to, to problem solving. And problem solving is, is a benefit for all our, our um, for all learning. So, so one activity that I've used, and again, you can do this as the tutor, is this game called Yes And. And some of you may have used this already. So you 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 give them um, a problem to solve or um, you ask them to, to report back on something. Um, but whatever it is, it starts with one student saying what their idea is or what their thought is or what their observation is. And then the second student or the tutor responds with yes, which is affirming. I've heard you. I'm not disagreeing with you. Yes. And and the second person adds on to or builds on what that first person said, and they keep going until they run out of ideas. Now, in the classroom, you would do this student to student if you've got more than one. But again, as a tutor, you could play that role. And that really supports their ability to problem solve. This idea of um, taking one idea and potentially creating a very different idea to the first idea. OK. Student agency. Student agency, we've already uh, mentioned briefly, but student agency was probably one of the only um, positives, and not for all students, because obviously they had very different experiences, that did come out of COVID-19. So this um, ability to actually make their own decisions when it comes to, you know, how they learn, when they learn, um, was actually key for many students um, in during COVID. But then they've gone potentially back into the classroom or even into the tutor room. And who's con in control of their learning now? Who's telling them when they need to show up for that learning and how to do that learning? So sometimes we've got to just take a step back and go, actually, can we can we let go of this control a little bit? And actually, can we give them a little bit more freedom in how they get from A to B? Um, and this is developing skills such as self-awareness, their own goal setting and time management. And when it comes to goal setting, it really is one of those skills that we need to support them with. So, you know, talk them through, you know, you know, name a goal that they're wanting to achieve. And it could be a certain grade in their maths or it could be something to do with, 
I don't know, something that's going on in their lives, whatever it is. But then you get them to start planning it and say, you know, what are the steps that's required for me to achieve that goal? In what order? And how long is it going to take each step? And actually, how am I going to feel when I've achieved it? Because it's the how I feel that's going to keep them going. It's that positive mindset that's going to keep them going. And that comes on to this one, which I think is absolutely key. You know, students and teachers, you know, learning is tough. Let's not, let's not lie about it. But actually, research shows that for learning to occur, mental effort has to happen. And I'm usually really overt with the students about saying, oh, it's, it's hard this, isn't it? We're struggling. But actually, unless you struggle, you can't learn because that's just how we do the connections. So in order for them to, to recognize the struggle and continue the struggle, they need to remain positive and they need to persevere. So how do, how do you persevere? Well, you need a positive mindset. How do you support a student with a positive mindset? Well, again, you focus on what's the consequences of you achieving this task. Keep focusing on that. How are you going to feel? All right. What can you do with this consequence? Um, get them to call out their emotions. So when they're struggling, call it out. All right. Um, don't hide from it. Checking progress. You know, you've got five questions to do, for example. Oh, I can't do this. I can't do this. What have you done? So you've done two. You've done two. That's brilliant. You've only got three to go. So the language you use to show that you are making progress, you feel you're miles away from the end line, but actually you're not as far as you think. You are making progress and you need to help them see where they are in terms of that line of the progress. And as I keep saying, you are getting there. They need to keep their eye on the finish line. OK, moving on to the, the last set here. This is so important, maintaining a positive teacher and student relationship. So, you know, obviously active listening, respect, process information. These are all things we've already discussed. But I think to Sarah's point, we have to model this. All right. So quite often, um, Certainly when I'm visiting schools at the moment and the, uh, the Bennett way of authoritative discipline that's going on in our schools today by the uh, behaviour czar, if anybody uh, knows Mr. Bennett, um, what you're witnessing is um, students being disciplined and being told the consequence, but there's no dialogue for why they've been given this consequence or what's happened or, you know, let's have both sides of the, the story. Um, so learning to, to, to manage conflict and be open about managing conflict actually is a really important skill for us as teachers or tutors to actually demonstrate to, to our um, tutees. Um, again, because I'm not um, a tutor, I, although I think I heard somebody saying just as I joined the call earlier that you know, conflict does occur between even a tutor and a tutee. If it's one to one, there may be conflict that occurs. But it's the same tips that you would give a student in terms of, you know, if they've, they've fallen out or they're trying to manage conflict. You yourself have to remain calm. You know, take a few minutes and breathe. It's all right. So it's a little bit being like the parent, isn't it? It's OK to say, look, let's just take a moment and then let's come back to it. All right. Let's both take a time out and let's come back to it because it gives you thinking time. It gives you calming time. But you're also demonstrating a strategy for the other student, uh, for the student as well. And then it's the usual stuff, you know, be present, be specific, use I statements um, rather than you. And it's about positive language. It's about actively listening. And actually, many students report that that's one of the key things they appreciate in their teachers is that that they feel heard, they feel listened to, uh, rather than just told all the time. Okay, um, I don't know how much presentation work goes on in um, for two T's, um, but I'd have thought there would be opportunity. And actually, the reason I showed this is because one of the key skills that um, uh, young people need, especially in employment, is this skill of being adaptable. 
Um, being adaptable is probably the employer's top social and emotional skill at the moment that they're asking for. And actually presentations, asking a student to do a presentation is um, a good way of teaching adaptability. So how do you go about doing it? Well, here are some tips you'd give a student uh, for getting a presentation together. First of all, practice your presentation to somebody else um, and ask them for feedback. So it could be a parent, it could be a sibling, it could be a friend who's not part of their tutor group, but ask for feedback. Then before you start the presentation, actually check in with what your audience expects. Make sure that you are clear what the presentation's about, so so is the audience. And keep, um, uh, do not get sidetracked, keep to your objectives. And then at the end, add a Q&A session, because it's from that session you can mop up anything that hasn't been addressed in the, in the, um, uh, in the uh, presentation. But it also gives you a chance to get feedback to improve your next presentation. Now, because you are tutors, this feedback and Q&A may just be with you but you can still play that role that actually supports their adaptability. Okay, preparing for tests. Again, we've mentioned these already, but the skills that are required for, for students to prepare for tests are of course, stress management, goal setting, time management and perseverance. Um, and finding tutor time or lesson time to focus just on those skills actually will pay off. But, you know, it's one of those things, isn't it? As a, as a tutor, can you do a session purely on those skills with a parent who potentially is paying for you to do some maths revision, all right? And so part of this is also potentially educating parents to why these skills are appropriate in your sessions as well. But again, you know, that's not a relationship I've got, I'm privy to, I'm more used to relationships between parents and um, within a school setting. But again, you know, it's the usual tips. How do we prepare them for tests? You know, the ideas of around time management and stress management are really important. Um, being realistic, we know. Um, and again, something I heard as I joined this call, and I think it was a discussion around phonics, but sometimes we have to demonstrate as teachers that we are creative thinkers as well, all right? There's not one way to solve things or to get from A to B or to, to revise for a test or whatever. There are different ways and different ways to different learners. But I'm also of the belief that um, sometimes we shouldn't shy away from potentially areas um, that um, or strategies or, or learning that some students find difficult. Sometimes we can focus or just go, oh, well, you know, this is their preferred way, so we must always do this. Actually, Working on some of their um, lesser comfortable areas will also benefit them. So don't, try not to shy away from sometimes things that um, may appear too difficult as well. Um, we need to get a balance. Um, and that certainly came out of if any of you remember, you know, two decades ago in teaching, everybody talked about learning styles. You were you were you were an audio learner, you were kind of aesthetic, you were a visual learner, you were this, that and the other. And actually then teachers were going, oh, right, okay, so I've got to plan for my visual, I've got to plan for the kinesthetic, I need to know who is who. And actually that, that made us fall into some awful teaching traps. Actually, we should always provide a wide range of stimulus and, and uh, teaching approaches for our students. Some will prefer some over others, but actually they've also will get learning from persevering and, and developing certain areas of their, their learning as well. So we've got to get the balance, all right? And they need to recognize when they find certain things hard and that's an area for them to, to, to further develop. Okay, finally, and I should really hand over to, uh, nearly finally, we've mentioned this already, this idea of growth mindset. Growth mindset is around staying positive, perseverance and self-confidence. Um, again, you know, you as a tutor, obviously my tip here is around putting things up on classroom walls, literally throwing it at them. But for me, a growth mindset is about that language. So again, I think, um, um, Vicky, I think it was you who talked about, um, you know, showing failure 
um, in a positive light. But I, I would say that's exactly what it is. It's being mindful of um, the fact that sometimes things don't um, always go to plan, but we still learn from them. Everything is a learning opportunity and we will grow from it. And it's having that per, um, positive language that's um, required. OK, finally, um, this is what I was going to say to Sarah. It's modeling behavior, you know, how you appear with the students, how you listen to them, how you, um, you know, manage any conflict that might may occur with them, um, even in a one to one situation. Everything you do, they are watching, they are observing, they are learning from. OK, and that includes us showing our emotions. All right. They often think we're not human. Uh, to, to kids <laughs> but actually when we show our emotion what it shows we are human just like you but they're observing how you're managing that emotion whether it's stress or, or whatever it is and it's that second part we've got to be really mindful of it's not about hiding our emotions it's about how we show them we manage and uh, what we do with those emotions whether it's happy or sad uh, whether I, something really great's happened or read, whether I'm frustrated, you know, as a teacher, or as, as a tutor, that's the bit they're watching and that's the bit they're going to learn from. And it's the, it's the hard bit. And sometimes, you know, we're not we're not perfect, are we? And that's fine to say as well. You know, I've gone back into classrooms and gone, you know what? Let's talk about what happened at the end of, you know, last lesson. OK, I, you know, didn't handle this very well. This happened, blah, blah, blah. It's fine. You're showing the human side, but you're also showing how you resolve situations as well. OK, I have spoken for way, way, way too long. Um, what I want to do now is um, with that noise and those strategies, I would love to hear from you guys. So whether you want to put a, a hand up or just um, open the mic. As tutors, what social and emotional uh, learning are you already deploying in your in your sessions i'd love to hear and learn from you guys so so what are you already doing some of you in terms of developing some of these skills thank you given us 10 different things for us to mull over right now so we're probably still processing to be to be honest but I think I, I think it's fair to say that there are a lot of things that we intrinsically do and we may not have known what category it fell under or if it was number one or number seven or, or 10, but there are things that we naturally put into place. So perhaps it's not necessarily a question of what are we already doing, but what are we doing that's working and what can we do to, to move things along a little bit better? Yeah, and, and and sorry, and just so uh, I may have got just got missed. I, I, what I wasn't asking was which of those ten are you already doing. I just wanted to to hear uh, what you what what you were already doing, just in your in your own experience, your own understanding of social and emotional skills. Forget the ten; you may be doing some of that. I wanted to hear just generally, like what you guys are doing. Sorry, no, um, Lucy. Yeah, I just thought, um, yeah, I mean, tutoring, we're really lucky that because it's, you know, it's so young person centered, um, you know, you mentioned like agency and things like that. Well, that's something that we often don't have to consider quite as much as school, like classroom practitioners, because there's not the demands on the young person that that school places. Um, so probably for me, um, one of the most important things we I, I specialize in supporting students with the PDA profile so mm. demands are really challenging for them um, and so you know positioning the learning in a really um, like pedagogically aware from an educator's point of view and the assessment behind the scenes is obviously on point but to the young person it seems like you just want to know about them and what they're interested in. And, you know, you sort of like, just seem like you're a really big kid, like interested in like what they want to tell you about. And then it's up to you to in your head be going, okay, right, mapping against curriculum, what level can we be doing here? Or what could we be doing that's gonna, you know, go down that avenue that they want to go down? Uh, so, you know, for example, I, I have a student at the moment who will only communicate 
with me through playing a computer game. Um, so nonverbal does, you know, I'm not trying to push that young person to communicate sort of verbally with me. Um, but when we're playing a game in the chat, they're like, duh, 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 what do you think about this? Duh, 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 you know, and I, I think that's really cool. Um, but is totally different to class teaching, you mm. know? Um, so we're lucky. Mm -hmm. But some of you do, I mean, it's interesting what you've described there is like you said, that is, that is agency. You know, yeah, you are, exactly. you are, that's per lovely illustration of that um, yeah. sense of, and, and, and maybe what I'm hearing from you, Lucy, is because it's commonly one-to-one, -one, it's easier to, to adopt that agency for that individual student. Thank you for sharing that, Lucy. Anybody else got any anecdotes or, you know, experience that they'd, they'd like to share around social emotional learning that they're, they're using in, the, in their sessions? Jade? Yeah, well, I, I had mentioned this in the chat, but um, I was just going to expand upon a little bit, I guess. But um, uh, yesterday I had uh, three students. I, I tutor with a company called Latera, and I teach English uh, reading skills with, with them. And uh, one of the students, um, I, I guess I had expanded the whiteboard on my the the the, the uh, platform is called Learn Cube, so I'm still learning how to use the system. Well, I expanded the whiteboard on it, and then suddenly all the students were gone. I was like, "What had happened? I can't hear them. I can't see them." So when I went back, I saw that one of the students was like talking and laughing with her friends, and I uh, I I could turn on her mic and her her video, and she didn't know that. So I let her know, you know not to be talking with her friends this is a session um and uh, i think i i i looked it up later that i should have viewed it as a courtesy to warn her as opposed to a consequence so it came out probably in my voice that i was angry at her and that i was you know emotionally not maybe understanding where maybe she was coming from but i also realized that afterwards you know, I want to do better. So I love, obviously I looked up how to approach that better. And this morning um, I wrote down rules that I wanted them to follow, but I also wrote things that I would improve upon. So I was going to learn the platform better. You know, I made those rules so that they know, listen, I'm taking responsibility for not making that clear to you from day one that that is not appropriate behavior. Um, I want them to know that I'm going to uh, continue to appreciate what they're doing. I recognize that things happen. There's going to be distractions. Somebody's around you. You know, you are, you guys are trying. And that was my fault. I'm a work in progress just like you guys. So I think adding in that we are not the ones that are completely knowledgeable we don't have everything we make mistakes and letting them know not only that we make mistakes but that we want to get better can let them know we're more on their level wow, wow. Jane, they are very lucky students to have you i mean you have just demonstrated how quickly you turned that from you know it's a learning moment isn't it for you as a teacher and you've you just demonstrated managing conflict to them you demonstrated a growth mindset to them you know you are that model for them that that is outstanding utterly outstanding yeah. what a note to finish. Layla, i could just bottle that i feel like that was the high point of the whole thing <laughs> so far because just being able to i know jade being able to give you that positive feedback and just capture that win of, of adjusting well, it's really, really beautiful. That's teaching and learning. Mm. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, beautiful. Yeah. Um, yeah. Thank no. you. Yeah, just amazing. And 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 guys, I just, you know, I've th through my now new uh, friendship with Julia, I'm hoping to learn so much about tutoring and actually um, hopefully also get the academic world to start looking at you guys from a learning perspective as well. There's so much to be learned from 
the work you do with with young people, the important work that um, you know. I the more I hear and, and can learn from Julia and you guys, the more I hope to play a role in in, in feeding that into academia as well. So thank you very much for allowing yeah. me this time with you. We are really, really grateful for that, Lisa, Leila. You know, um, something very special happened before. We hosted Ayush from Pencil Spaces. And at the end, he said, I have never spoken with a more passionate group of professionals. And that meant the world to us in the room here. So mm -hmm. um, thank you so, so much for, 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 for bringing the, the OECD that I'm going to go and read at bedtime tonight. Thank you so much. <laughs> um, and if you guys would like to check out Persona, um, I've been playing it with my kids and it's really, really fantastic to um, go through a social and emotional curriculum with the children in a format that they can access with confidence. So it's really working very well. Thank you. Amazing. Oh. Well, have, a, have a good rest of the day, guys. I'm going to drop off now. But um, yeah. And um, I think Georgina, did oh, you say you, were, you went to Yui? I did, yeah. It was 20 years ago now, but yeah, that was where I stood. <laughs> <laughs> brilliant, brilliant. Well, we love our alumni, so uh, bye, everyone. Have a good rest of your day. Thank you so much, Lena. Thank you. Bye, guys. Bye. Amazing. Right, everyone, we are a little bit behind schedule, so what I will suggest is that we take three minutes. We meet back here at 3.05. Stretch your legs, get your head ready, because we have a fantastic final session with Lucy specifically on alternative provision. So go get yourself in the right mindset, take some breaths, come back, last round.